Okay, we're here today at the East Ridge Rec Center in Highlands Ranch with Jeff Kappas. We're about to embark on an oral history for Jeff to tell us some things about his longtime involvement in the community that became Highlands Ranch. So, welcome to you, Jeff. This oral history is going to be taken down to the Douglas County Archives and Local History section for viewing long term and probably will be published on the Highlands Ranch Historical Society's website at some point in the near future as well. So, Jeff, why don't you begin by telling us how you got involved and when in the community that ultimately became known as Highlands Ranch. Sure, Mark. Um, so, uh, really, I uh, uh, was working here in, in, uh, in the Denver area in the cable television business right out of college. Now, when, when was this? Which that, year was this? That was in 19, late 78. Early '79, um, and I had gotten to know Diane Tepper, Jim Tepper's daughter. Jim Tepper was the, the president coming, of president of the Colorado Mission Viejo Company, absolutely. who came out here to potentially develop the community of Highlands Ranch. Correct, and then we're already developing the community of Mission Viejo Aurora, just to kind of get a foothold in the industry here and. Uh, uh, so I had gotten to know Diane, and um, uh, I was working in the table in the cable television business. And uh, uh, he called me and and uh, offered me this job. And I knew very little about what they were doing. I knew it was about communities. I knew it was they had a rec center that they had already developed in Mission Viejo Aurora. And uh, uh, but that was about all I knew. And it was he wanted me to be kind of community services and do a lot of Was that of the job services. title you were, you were hired for? That, uh, the first job I had was community services representative. Yes. And what did you think that entailed? You know, I really, again, I, I didn't know. What I knew is that it sounded like a great opportunity because they were going to be growing over the, the course of years. Um, I knew it was going to be out and about doing a lot of things in the development business. I just didn't really have the finer detail of the job. He talked about events at the rec center in Mission Viejo Aurora. He talked about possibly some events out at this mansion. Uh, but I, I didn't know, really. I hadn't been toured. I really didn't understand the whole background of how they were here and why they were here. But it sounded great. I wasn't too happy where I was, and so I jumped. We understood that Art Cook had come from California to be the community spokesman in addition to the ranch manager. What was your relationship with Art Cook? Yeah, so Art actually was my, my first boss here. Um, and I worked very, very closely with Art uh, early on uh, in Mission Viejo, but really very quickly we, we uh, started working on Highlands Ranch. And it was when the Highlands Ranch development plan was just being created, uh, being worked through the Douglas County process, um, and so we really started getting engaged with Highlands Ranch at that time, um, doing events at the mansion, uh, tours of the mansion, uh, in advance of the plan even being approved, just to get people kind of clued into what we were planning to do out here. I understand there was uh, a bit of initial opposition to having this development occur oh, yeah, from a California company. Oh particularly something as large as this uh, was thought to be, in a largely rural county, Douglas Absolutely. County, on the edges of Colorado, where there had been significant uh, political opposition to urban sprawl at right. that time. Right. Well, I will tell you, and this is a bit of me using hindsight here, but at the time, again, I was just a kind of a fresh kid out of college and didn't know, much, didn't know much about the development business. But I remember as this was all taking place and we were engaged with, with groups out of the mansion and, and trying to, to get people familiar with what we were doing, I remember uh, when they hung a, a, a dummy from the Highlands Ranch uh, head gate at, the, at Broadway and County Line Road. And I remember seeing that and thinking, 
what are we getting ourselves into? What is going on here? Not knowing the extreme nature of that sentiment, of the, the community set sentiment and the, and the opposition that was here. So I think really I was blessed with just kind of sort of not knowing because it was easier just to just put my head down and just keep doing my job. So I'm assuming that some of the meetings that you went to were largely educational in nature uh, to minimize some of the people who had perceived objections to what was going to happen south of County Line Road. Absolutely. Most of them were presentations on the plan, tours of the mansion, presentations of the plan, uh, groups like uh, uh, you know the Douglas County Republicans and I really don't think there was a Democrat in Douglas County, but but might have had the Democratic group as well, yeah. um, uh, and any other any other party that could possibly influence what was going on relative to the uh, the entitlement of Highlands Ranch at Douglas County. For what sure. was the general reaction to your presentations? Well, you know, I I think generally. Uh, you know, certainly I wasn't privy to the discussions afterwards when after they had left. But generally, uh, a little bit of surprise because the size and scale of the community was very, very significant relative to what existed just south of Rappo Road, for instance. Um, uh, but so a little bit of surprise, but and a lot of curiosity, a lot of questions. Um, and so we had to have a lot of follow-up sessions as well, and a lot of follow-up dialogue with folks, because there were a lot of questions that, frankly, Art nor I, and we, it was generally Art and me doing many of these uh, presentations. Sometimes we need to bring Jim Tepfer or Craig McCallum in, to people who are a little bit more technically. McCallum was one. the number two guy. He was, he was yes. the vice president. Yes, at that time he was, yes. Okay. Um, How long did this process go on? I realized that you were you were developing and uh, updating the development plan for quite a while. Right. It was um, it was probably a good year of just that solid kind of activity, if you will. And um, and you know along the way, then you know initially we didn't even own the ranch. We were just we had an option to purchase from yeah. the Highland Venture Group, and we also had lots of other events out there for their. We had weddings out there that some of their kids had, some of the partners with the ventures. Yeah, had. Tell me your involvement in that process. It was just basically organizing the event for them, and being at the mansion and making sure everything went smoothly and those types of things. And uh, The mansion yeah. hadn't been lived in since 1976 when the elder Phipps died. Uh, it had not, yeah. So it was, it was, uh, it was an interesting and lovely place, but you know, not nearly as well kept it as, as it is today, uh, because it had not been occupied, and it was, you know, seemed like 50 miles from the closest, you know, grocery store for sure. So it was out here in the middle. I, I remember one event actually, and I was brand spanking new, and there was nothing at Highland Ranch except dirt roads and uh, and the head gate at Broadway for the most part, and then the mansion. Finished up, I think it was a wedding. Uh, uh, I can't remember exactly who it was, but it was for one of the partners of the Highland Ventures. And uh, it was midnight, 1230 or so, and I jumped in my truck, thought I had done everything just perfect. And I was driving out the ranch road, and I looked in my rearview mirror and saw one light up on, uh, in the upstairs was still on. And I thought to myself, man, I, I can't leave a light on. You know, I'm just starting this job, I got to do everything just perfect, right? So, dashed back and man, running through that mansion when it's dark to find one light, the hair on the back of my neck was sticking straight up, and I swear there was noises that weren't there before. So, uh, <laughs> I know you've probably heard stories about the possible haunting of Highland. I've Street. heard some stories about that. Yeah. But, uh, so, I was out there a ways, as you know. So, it's good. Any other um, activities at the mansion you were involved in coordinating that come to mind as being especially interesting? Yeah, I mean, we had all kinds of activities, uh, especially once we got involved with, with community here. Once after our initial closings took place, uh, I mean, we had 
mansion activities, you know, lined up all during the year. Barbecues, picnics, uh, all types of different, you know, Fourth of July uh, type of parades around the mansion. You know, and these are times when there might have been 25, 30 uh, houses occupied at the time. But Mission Viejo Company, and Art Coates specifically, was not confused. He, he knew what it took to start building, not, not the plant community, but the community, the heart of the community. And that was about events, and that was about engaging people. And, uh, and frankly, our, one of our biggest marketing uh, boosts, I think, were those events, just because early, early ad adopters who bought Highland Ranch would go off to other places in town and said, what a marvelous, can't believe what we did at the Highlands Ranch Mansion this past weekend. And uh, we had, you know, not only at the mansion, but we had events, uh, you know, Santa's arrival was always a really big event. And um, uh, I just remember one time, what Art would always be the master of ceremonies and he'd be calling on the radio to the North Pole, finding out where, where Santa was. And uh, he had this great voice, you know, Highland Ranch calling Santa Claus, and uh, and uh, or calling the North Pole. And I would, uh, I'd be again. I'm a kid. I don't really know what's going on. I'm just doing what I'm told. Right. I'm over in the tree, a tree bosk, someplace with the other microphone, and I'm the elf answering the phone. So I had to disguise my voice, and you know, come up with a goofy. Hey, this is the elf. Santa Claus is on his way, and and you know, the crowd would just kind of the kids would just because he'd play it over the the microphone, and I always remember just talking to Art and saying, dude, after, after like the first one, I said, you need to know, unless you treat me right and you give me good raises, I could, I could say something really wrong on, on you know, live radio at Santa's arrival, and so uh, we always got a big kick out of that. But, uh, My understanding that the activities originated in California with the Mission Viejo group, and the best practices that they might have had in California, many of them, including the North Pole, um, were brought to Cal brought to Colorado Absolutely. because they worked in California. Absolutely, yeah. I uh, certainly we had our own flavor here. Uh, we had, you know, uh, an active cattle ranching operation, and uh, and early on, I mean, that was a big part of what we had to manage was the you know art. And I helped. I uh, was probably more hurtful than helpful many times, but managing the the cowboys that lived here and that that operation. Um, but we had a lot of events up at the barns. Uh, you know, heavens, we had uh, what did we have? We had brandings and we had even castration, which always amazed me that we'd invite people to come and witness that. But that was kind of a Big fun thing for the community. We had uh, certainly a lot of other events um, uh, all over the community, depending on what the, the flavor was. But we've seen some pictures from the early years. The early years being probably 1982, 1983, maybe 1984, with the kids hanging on the fences, mm -hmm. and either the local cowboys or the imported. Cowboys for spring branding coming right. with their branding irons holding the cattle to the calves down if you will And I understand there might have been some pushback from the community in terms of the smell of branding of burning flesh And so that didn't go on forever As Especially right before you went off to the barbecue right and right over in front of the right. mansion, right? I understand that our cook was the barbecue master Oh, okay. Maybe others were involved too. We've seen a number of pictures where it really was a community event and they had tables and lots of typically Mission Viejo staff lined up serving the community there at the mansion. And, and I was one of them. And I was always on the uh, barbecue team as well, uh, along with a number of other people. We, uh, we'd always, you know, spend the night before rubbing down I can't even tell you how many pounds of beef and with a, a barbecue rub and whatnot, and wrapping it up and getting the pit ready and burying it all and 
and I'm covering it the next day. We did have one occasion where, you know, you get it all buried and it just sits there overnight. And we came back and the whole thing had caved in just completely. And Whoa. we had, you know, hundreds of people coming shortly. And so it was kind of a wing and a prayer, but it was all cooked just deliciously, even though it had caved in. It was just awesome. Where was the barbecue pit? Moved around uh, from time to time, but what started off over on the kind of the southwest side of the mansion, and then uh, after a while, we kind of moved it out towards the front. I don't know why for sure. I think we just got too many people uh, active around the mansion itself, so we kind of moved it out towards the front, uh, sort of by the gate out, out there someplace, but I can't remember for sure. My understanding is that Mission Viejo was owned by Philip Morris. Yes. So many of these pictures that occurred in the mid-80s, roughly, were there was noticeable uh, presence of Miller beer oh, yeah. and Marlboro cigarettes right. in the pictures. And I asked Jim Teffer at one point, why was that? And he says, well, gee, our corporate parent is Philip Morris, and so we're just doing what's right. Right, right. Uh, yeah, it was... Always in our offices and and uh, and at events, you know, always very present. Um, the Philip Morris people would come out periodically for tours and and make sure that they were kind of at least paying a little bit of attention. We were a very unique operating company uh, relative to all of their other uh, companies, but uh, uh, yeah, it was it was a significant thing. I I will never forget the day that that Shea Holmes acquired us. Uh, we went from having cigarettes and Miller beer in the office uh, with the next day getting a, a note from, I think it was John Shea saying, hey, you know, we're a non-smoking company. So if you, we'd encourage you to smoke and here's a little spiff if you do quit smoking. So and this was, was 19, that was, 1997? That was in 1997. And that happened. Yeah. That's yeah. true. My understanding is the activities committee came again as a good idea from California. When was it formed here and who comprised it? I'm oh, assuming you had some involvement with it I because did. you were coordinating activities. Right, so I was involved, obviously Art was involved, uh, Mary Putman, uh, you might have heard Mary's I name have. before, uh, Beth Kinch, who is now Beth Nyhoff, mm -hmm. uh, was very involved. Uh, and then, you know, we, we would grab people from our organization to help and participate in, in any ways we could. But the big effort was to, to get the community involved. And, yeah. and very early on, we had significant community involvement, uh, uh, you know, pretty significant. Yeah. Gary Danny yeah. has told us just that same thing, right. that it was a, it was a big deal. It was a big deal, and I think, you know, as soon as people got involved and they started seeing that, hey, this was their community, and they could actually impact what these events were and the different opportunities to build the community and build pride within the community. Um, uh, they, the Highlands Ranch Activities Committee was what it was called, and, and uh, they were true, true to the cause of, of building community pride, and that was really sort of the... Uh, the the purpose for that committee was to build community pride. We've seen a lot of pictures at the mansion upstairs in one of the rooms from early versions of the Highlands Ranch Reporter, mm -hmm. which my understanding was kind of a Mission Viejo newspaper that came out quarterly or whenever, several times per year, which had lots of pictures and was basically promoting why Highlands Ranch would be a good place to move to, particularly if you were a family. Sure. I understand at one point there was a soapbox derby. Did you have any involvement in that? You know, I don't think I did have a, a lot of involvement in a soapbox derby. I think that was really, I kind of moved on from, from community services, which was really more involved with uh, uh, I helped out with architectural review on things and then all of the community events and uh, public relations issues and whatnot. I, uh, I moved on to a department that was called Community Association Development and Administration, or CADA for short. And I kind of run, ran that group with Bill Holstrom's, mentioned Bill earlier with his help. And uh, 
So when, when I made that transition, um, many of the events were just, uh, art continued on with different staff. They were staff still members. run by the activities committee? Yes, yes, okay. absolutely. And there'd be different people float in and out of the activities committee as people moved in and out. And yeah. some, some stalwarts who lasted a very long time. My understanding is the activity eventually morphed to some degree into what's now known as the Highlands Ranch Community Association. Is that true? The activities committee itself? Yeah, or? Yeah, no, not really. I, the, the Highlands Ranch Community Association was really a, a specific creation. Um, uh, well, I'll, let me take a step back. I recall, again, as a fairly uh, new person here, sitting in many meetings about, okay, how do we manage the, the municipal needs of this community? And there was basically two alternatives, metro districts and, and or a community association. And I remember sitting in meetings with, I'm not sure if you've heard these names, but Mano Wilhelm, uh, Wilhelms and Jerry Onya Benny and attorneys, more attorneys than I cared to think about, talking about which way we should go with that. But uh, eventually, uh, as you know, we said, well, we're gonna do some of the services under the Metro District banner, others under the Community Association banner, that's where it landed. And then we did create the Highlands Ranch Community Association specifically to provide those specific, you know, those services that it- That was in the out. late 80s, is that right? Oh no, that would have been earlier. Earlier than that. Yeah, because we had to have the Community Association established for the first closing, because they were, they were members of that community association uh, right out of the chute. So that was, that was a very, very early effort to get the community association up and running so that when that first house closed, they were the first member of the association. So if we transition to your second major job that you just spoke to, how did that go and what were your primary responsibilities? Yeah, really, uh, uh, Primary responsibilities were sort of what the, the name of the department was. It was developing and administrating the, uh, the, the various associations that had to be created within Highlands Ranch. So there was 20, I don't know exactly, but 20 to 25 sub-associations created within Highlands Ranch for specific neighborhoods that had specific needs not provided by either the Metro District or the Highlands Ranch Community Association. So ultimately they got delegates that were elected? Yeah, typically those associations, there were many, many communities or neighborhoods within Highlands Ranch that did not have the sub-association because they didn't have any unique services. Sub-associations were things that were needed because like townhomes or condominiums or communities with unique services to be provided for that neighborhood had to have a sub-association to provide those unique services because the community association was not set up to do it. And typically those sub-associations would also be their own delegate district for to the community association, yes. But then there would be many other delegate districts that uh, existed for other neighborhoods that were not sub-associations but you know, our job was to create those associations uh, to we sat on the boards you know, as a, the developer represent, representatives for years and years uh, in, in the various associations as we went through the community and uh, and then gradually turned those associations over to to homeowners as homeowners closed. What was your educational background? Um, I, I was in Colorado State University and have a degree uh, uh, business uh, administration degree and marketing. How relevant was your education to the activities that you were being asked to do as kind of a young kid? Or yeah, initially learn, I would tell you learn probably, on the job thing. Say it again, I'm sorry. Was this learn on the job? It was, uh, to a great extent, it was learn on the job. Um, you know, the early years in terms of, of just community services was not something I studied at all. It was uh, it was new, and then the whole community association, I probably couldn't have spelled the community association when I was in college, much less worked on it. But, uh, um, but then, you know, as, as things progressed, I, I got, got, got into it, some land sales opportunities, which I, I did have a lot of opportunity to, to pull some educational uh, elements mm -hmm. from my time up in, in Fort Collins. And, uh, 
And then certainly I took over the marketing department in the late 80s or early 90s, I can't remember really when, but fairly early on took over the marketing department and had a, a lot of, of help uh, along the way and, and used a lot of my learning from CSU. One of the things you talked about was architectural control. Over the years, and I've lived in Highlands Ranch for 23, 25 years, whatever, and I've gotten a couple letters about painting my garage door or whatever. Sure. Some people seem to think that that's a controversial topic, but explain Mission Viejo and eventually Shea's uh, importance of how important architectural controls are and were to the community. Yeah, I think uh, uh, certainly were and certainly still are uh, important to the community. Um, uh, not, you know, covenant controlled communities were not new necessarily to Colorado. There are many, many smaller communities that were covenant controlled uh, communities. Uh, certainly nothing like Highlands Ranch. I mean, there wasn't a new planned plan community like Highlands Ranch. So having it be covenant controlled was a little bit of a, a new uh, element to the region. Um, and we kind of, we frankly had a tiger by our tail because this community grew pretty quickly and there were a lot of improvements coming at us very, very quickly. And while we had set up guidelines for improvements and, and what could be built, what couldn't be built, you, you know, the, the human beings are very, very creative about what they would like to do. And um, uh, we, we had to make it up as we were going along when we got some medals for whatever the improvement might be. And, uh, and had to make up guidelines as to why that wasn't okay, and and uh, but certainly it's not a not not a secret the value of what a covenant, covenant controlled community is is uh, uh, about, and and the value of that, and how it protects property values, etc. I do have to say this is just a funny little story because again, fairly fresh uh, in in this industry, Art said I need you to do the architectural. Review and control and need you to handle that. So great, started working on it. I had kind of an old beat up pickup truck that I didn't have, I couldn't afford to get a new, new vehicle yet. But I thought, you know, okay, well, we have to do all these tours around the community and make sure people are doing what they said they're doing and that there's not violations. And so I thought it'd be a great idea to put some magnet signs on the side of my truck Highlands Ranch Architectural Committee. So people would know that we're out looking around and if they had questions, that was a mistake. People did not like the architectural committee initially because they weren't used to being told what to do and disappointed when we wouldn't approve their plans. And uh, I didn't, I got some bad looks. No one threw anything as I drove through the neighborhood, but uh, those signs didn't last long on my car yeah. for sure. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. You had some involvement with some of the early activities uh, that occurred in the community and might even have been in the mansion. The first year where we had homeowners, my understanding was starting around the summer of 1981 and progressed with more into the, to the, the fall. That was probably a challenge because even with discounts, I understand that the interest rates on mortgages came down from 18 or 21 percent down to 11 and a half. Still significant, particularly in comparison to interest rates today. Right. So the people who moved here were pioneers to some degree, Absolutely. moving so far out from anything else uh, and doing that. Uh, tell us about some of the activities that occurred that first year where the community actually had homeowners. Yeah, but the very first one I can remember, Mark, was, was really around Thanksgiving. Um, I know we probably had some smaller events where we got people together, just mixtures to get to know one another, might have had something up to manage, but the most uh, memorable one early on was, was the Thanksgiving celebration. Um, uh, we had about 30, as I recall, 35 homes occupied, and again, uh, Beth was Kinch at the time, Beth Nyhoff now and I were uh, both participating in the activities committee and, and um, uh, we just thought it would be a great idea for us to, 
to dress up and deliver turkeys to the community. So one beautiful fall weekend, that was probably the weekend before Thanksgiving, um, uh, Beth was the pilgrim, I was the turkey, and, and uh, we delivered 35 turkeys to our very first homeowners. And uh, it was interesting because you could, you could really, I mean, as goofy as that sounds, uh, it was meaningful for those people because, because those folks were early adopters. They, they were taking risk. Um, many had been told that they were crazy by friends from neighborhoods further north when they said they're moving to Highlands Ranch, uh, just so far out there. And so I think just those types of efforts, and um, you could see it in their eyes where they just were so grateful and and kind of sort of knew, okay, that maybe this is going to be just fine, you know? So. Good. Yeah. I understand that Highlands Ranch was marketed not just as another development, but with the phrase of the new town of Highlands Ranch, the emphasis being on new. Highlands Ranch had been the name, the name of the Phipps Highlands Ranch right. at some point. And I heard there was even a song that was developed to help in marketing this new town of Highlands Ranch. There was, and it was, we used it a lot, and I gotta believe we can find it somewhere. Uh, I haven't searched every nook and cranny, but I bet it's out there someplace. But it was a, a cute little jingle. It wasn't more than probably 30 seconds long. It was a marketing jingle, uh, but we used it a lot. It was a uh, very well done piece. Uh, and uh, yeah, I would love to hear it again. It'd be fun to, to find it, look it How out. How did you use this little jingle? Was it on radio spots? Ra radio spots, for sure. We really didn't have uh, in the early days, television uh, commercials, but most mostly radio, uh, for sure, was involved in radio. And how successful was this jingle in attracting the audience that you wanted to take a look at this new community? Yeah, you know... Um, like most advertising, how do you measure it, effectiveness? It's very, very difficult to, to measure, you know, how effective various <laughs> uh, pieces and parts are. but. We, I've learned over the years with marketing efforts uh, with Mission Video Company and with Shea, it is a, you know, it is the, the whole that impacts the market, not each individual piece, but right. it, it is the jingles combined with the, the, uh, the, the, the ads in the newspaper, combined with the events, combined with everything. So it is the, the kit of parts that impacts the market rather than the individual piece and uh, but I think the jingle was very memorable and I think it, it was around for a while. When Highlands Ranch was started they were known as a master plan community developer as yeah. well as a home builder and though they might not have been the exclusive home builder initially they were the best. My understanding is initially there were three neighborhoods or developments or models that were developed right. at different price points. Right. Explain that. Yeah, bit, so why how that happened. Well, um, uh, generally in order to attract the broadest market to this far away place called Highlands Ranch, we had to provide more than just one offering of homes. So we we had everything from kind of more of a starter home, uh, which was in the groves, uh, to Stony Point, which was a higher end, a larger, uh, both single family detached uh, uh, traditional homes. Uh, and then Bayfield was the, the program in the middle of those. So we started off with those three communities. Uh, they were uh, all three right in the north. North Ridge area, right, right off of Broadway, which was obviously where we started Highlands Ranch, um, and yeah, had a, a wonderful time putting together model complexes for those new communities, um, and uh, you know, I think that was really one of the the turning points for Highlands Ranch. Once there was model communities for people to come out and see, uh, was really when we started getting a little bit more traffic. Target market was families for the most part. Absolutely, yeah. Families have children. Children get to an age that need to be in schools. Sure. How did the community 
meet those needs? Well, um, Northridge Elementary School uh, was built very, very early on. Uh, basically uh, built and given to the Douglas County School District to accommodate those those families with young children. So that was one of the ways. Northridge Recreation Center also built very early on in the life of Highlands Ranch. Initially first phase, then it was expanded uh, in, in subsequent years, but we we knew, and I think this was also a carryover from Mission Viejo in California and the efforts of Mission Meal Company in California, that when you are building in a, in a what was perceived to be sort of a remote location out there, not a, not a drive-by, but really a destination, there had to be a there there for people to experience. And, couldn't be just a promise that, yeah, it'll come someday because it was too big of a risk. So we worked hard to bring those types of amenities, parks, recreation, schools, as early as we could possibly bring on commercial, we did. Even um, churches. Churches, yeah. very, very important part of, of obviously the, the fabric of a community. So, yeah, so um, we were very, very intentful about that. I you mentioned churches. Um, I remember having a conversation when I was getting into the land sales side of things because we were selling a church and the, the price point was for the land was just sort of ridiculous. And I remember Jim Tepper saying, you know, we have, we have, community has to have churches. So we'll sell the site for what the church can afford and we'll have a church. And it was pretty much that simple, right, at some point. You know, you had to see those types of of uh, amenities and those types of community needs in a place like Highland Church. In addition to that, Littleton being the nearest grocery store north of County Line, <clears throat> at some point the convenience center got developed. The, I'm sorry? The, the convenience center oh, yes. got developed over on the west side of Broadway. Right on. South of County Line. Very early. But the 7-Eleven and uh, Bank and... Uh, United Bank of Denver. Right on. Yeah, right on. Uh, so then that was very early on again as well. And I, I wasn't involved on the commercial side of things at all, so I can't tell you exactly how that came about, but it came about very early on, for sure. And the library had a branch there in the convenience right. center. Exactly. And Art Cook's wife was exactly. the head of that, that from what yeah. I remember. Right, she absolutely Later was. on then. So. so eventually your responsibilities changed, and you Mission Viejo, maybe toward the later part of the 80s, got involved instead of selling individual homes, but of selling land to other builders right. so that Mission Viejo wouldn't be the exclusive home builder in the area. Right. How did this decision, how did this decision come about? Well, I think, uh, frankly, it's just a function of scale of the community. I, uh, uh, a company like Mission Bio Company, we built a lot of houses. I think we were up to at 1.400 houses a year of Mission Bio Company built homes. But when you have a community the size of Highlands Ranch, you have to accommodate that growth with just more than one builder or our, what was our 40 year time period of development would have been much, much longer. So I think, again, experience from California brought to Colorado uh, uh, relative to bringing on communities the size and scale of Highlands Ranch said, at some point we need other builders, not only from the standpoint of, of uh, just other builder names, which is important, but other builders' marketing efforts, which was very much important other builders' products that we might not have been developed, have had developed yet. Uh, just a number of different things. But uh, yeah, I think it was just really a function of driving um, uh, to a certain amount of volume to accommodate, uh, you know, the growth that had to occur at Highlands Ranch in order to make the, the whole thing make sense financially. I heard at one point the plan was to fully develop Highlands Ranch 30,000 building units, 100,000 people over the first 25 years. It was. That was. Ultimately, it took 40. 
right. to do that, and we're in the 41st, 42nd year now of that right. development. Yeah, that was our that was our line it was 25 year project for sure, and that you know we always accompanied that statement with, but it is a it is a market dependent type of thing, right? I mean, uh, we can only go as fast as the market will allow us to go. So uh, that's true. Um, um, the, the 80s was a tough time, in, or the, in the early 90s was a tough time was, in Denver. Was, um, sure. The oil industry kind of crashed, Absolutely. from what I recall, and things were tough for oil. But then in the 90s, things just took off. Right, and very much so. a big uh, decade of growth, if it, you will. It was. And prior and, to Mission Viejo um, being acquired by Shea. Absolutely. And and because of that ramping up, I think that is when Mission Viejo Company said, okay, we can just kind of exit from the, the new home business here because we at that time had established a... Uh, you know, a group of builders here at Highlands Ranch that was doing very, very well in terms of providing the product demands for the, the you know, the community and the surrounding communities in terms of uh, new home needs. Uh, so Mission Video Company exited from the home building business uh, and uh, I was shifted into the land sales side of things. I worked with a gentleman by the name of Mark O'Reilly who was at the time uh, the Lone Ranger in that department, and uh, was this for Shea or for Mission? This Vio? was with Mission Bio Company. In what year was this? Was? This would have been in the early nineties, okay. yeah, maybe 94, 95, something like that. So your job changed to some degree. Changed again, so it kind of went from community services to the through the association management business into land sales. Yeah, and so uh, tell me, tell me about that. In terms of the land sale effort? In terms of your efforts and how yeah. things work, what you did? Well, we, we uh, were very, very engaged in the building community, very engaged with the Home Builders Association of Metropolitan Denver, and we just got to know every builder that was doing business on the south side of the Denver metropolitan area. How many builders was this? Well, ultimately, we had, uh, oh heavens, Mark, we had 10, 12 builders doing various communities. We were selling over 2,000 lots a year to uh, to the various builders who were here. Uh, and it was a machine. We, we did finished lots. So Mission Mule Company built all the lots, sold sold them as they were built. And we would have a kind of a work workout cycle on these contracts where the builders would buy lots on a phased basis. And, and uh, you know, it wasn't wasn't long. Highlands Ranch was the new home superstore of the Denver metropolitan area, and you know we had market share. I can't remember, but it was a very very significant market share of the overall metro area. I can remember the signs when you came into the community. There was a little pull off off to the side, and all the builders that had new homes for sale. Right, right on. Yeah, it was right there. Our guide. Whether on Broadway or on right. what ultimately became Lincoln, uh, entering the community from that side. You bet. Obviously, in that day and age, you had to have those. No one had phones. No one had the opportunity to see where things were. But uh, I do remember it was year in and year out for a number of years. Uh, Highlands Ranch was the number one best-selling master plan community in the nation. Um, Number one or number two. We always kind of had a little bit of about going with Summerlin, a, a master plan community in Las Vegas. But uh, we were always up there. We were always very, very proud that that we were being that well accepted in the market. Okay. That's good. So ultimately, high growth in the 1990s. Um, Mission Viejo, or excuse me, um, Philip Morris owning Mission Viejo decided to get out of the home buildings. And it was acquired by a company that had a very background uh, all over, but particularly in California, called uh, John Ashe. So, how did that come about, and how did your responsibilities change? Well, um, certainly, I, I can't tell you how it came about, other than Philip Morris uh, had the the desire to get out of our business, and I don't know why that was, or I don't have the financial kind of background as to that 
that decision uh, for sure. Um, but they made the decision that it was time to exit uh, their master plan community business. Uh, and we went through six to eight months of different builders and different, different companies coming in to Highland Ranch. I remember watching helicopters fly over this community and just knowing it was potential suitors for the purchase of Highland Ranch and Mission Bio Company as a whole, um, including the, the properties in California. Um, but uh, we, we had, to, had to tour a number of the finalists, you know, who were kind of the, the top six potential buyers and tour them, show them all around. We met with them. Uh, I, I remember that I was just, this is just a funny, quirky little thing because obviously in Colorado, with a community like Highlands Ranch, water is probably your most significant concern, right? You got enough water to feed the rest of the the uh, uh, property here, the undeveloped property. And we had a meeting with this one builder. I just thought this was so funny. And and we were we had gone already gone on a tour. They were asking some questions, and the, the leader of of their group said, "No." tell me a little bit about water and we talked about Centennial Water and Sanitation District which at the time Mission Bio Company sat was the the full board sat as the full board for Centennial and we gave a little presentation about that and he said he said so I have two questions for you then who sits on this board number one and number two would they like to have dinner with us tonight <laughs> And it was just such a, an interesting thing, because, and everybody chuckled, obviously, but it was, he was kidding, but it was about, we want to really make sure we get to know these people if we do buy this property, because water is so key to the, the continuing development of this community. My understanding is that way back in 1980, <clears throat> Joe Blake was so important in establishing some of the water rights and the relationships to use both surface and underground wells, and ultimately reservoirs that later on in the, in the mid 2000s, uh, first decade, whatever, where <clears throat> South Platte Reservoir was built and other relationships were used to use um, a city of Englewood facility, right. McClellan Reservoir, right. to meet some of the needs that this growing, very fast growing community in the 1990s was happening. You bet. Joe was so very important to to that effort, for sure. But I, I do have to tell you, we had such an unbelievable staff at Centennial from early on, before it was called Centennial. It was originally called Mission Viejo Water District, wasn't it? I, it was. And because uh, when the community started, this had been a private ranch, and they might have had some wells. And it was Mission Viejo Company at the time. It yeah. was, you know, uh, it did convert to Centennial. I can't remember the year. Uh, uh, and I've had a lot of questions as to why that was Centennial, other than the, the, the series Centennial that was filmed at the mansion, and that probably had something to do it, but do with it. But I do have to say, the staff at the Water District from day one was just top, top shelf. And John Hendrick, who ran uh, was a general manager for the district from day one to uh, don't know when John retired, but ten years ago or so ish. Uh, was just an unbelievable addition to what we were doing here. Uh, brilliant water mind, and certainly with with Joe, you know, on the board and at the helm, and other certainly other board members early on and other staff members, Jeff Case, a lot of really, really unbelievably talented people who secured those water rights and and worked to make sure that we had the type of, of, of water that was needed for this community. So there were a lot of suitors, and ultimately it turned out that Shea ended up buying. What exactly did they buy when they bought? What did they buy? They, they bought Mission Viejo Company and all of its assets from the Included undeveloped land. Uh, it in, included undeveloped land in both um, California and, and Highlands Ranch, Colorado. So in so Colorado, they, in the Highlands Ranch community, how much was left of the original 
roughly 22,000 acres that initially Mission Viejo had bought. Yeah, um, in this terms of percentage of developable, the yeah, I, I would say, geez, that's a really good question, Mark. Um, I, no shake. I would say that, uh, you know, generally we might have been 40% through at that point in time, maybe. That's a good question. I don't know for sure, uh, but my guess is about 40 to 50% complete at that, at that point in time. Mm hmm I'd say probably more closer to 40. But go ahead. Okay, we are resuming our oral history with Islands Ranch, longtime important person, <laughs> uh, Jeff Cattles, at that point. So, again, thanks for Jeff for continuing. Okay. You were involved in marketing at many times during your long time association with the communities of Islands Ranch, Mission Viejo, and Shea. Tell me about some of the things that you were involved in from a marketing point of view, right. realizing that at some point your role, particularly after Shea ended up buying the land here, Mission Viejo, involved me in marketing uh, the sale of homes. Right. So with Mission Viejo Company, before Shea, I did take on the responsibility for uh, uh, the, the, all of the marketing for Highlands Ranch. And it was really, really an exciting and fun time. I mean, because not only do you have this, this really interesting and living product, right? Uh, you had all these uh, builders here who were needed to make sure that you were servicing in terms of drawing people to their neighborhoods and whatnot. So it was a, it was a very, very interesting time. Every year we tried to come up with a, a new campaign, something that was meaningful to people. Uh, we really did settle on, and I, I, I loved the direction that uh, early on our campaigns took because we, we came to realize that even... You know, certainly before C-470 was built, people would drive up and down County Line Road and just kind of look in and, not for me, after C-470 was built, probably more so. You know, people just driving on C-470. And we really settled in on this notion of we have to pull people into this community. They're, they are missing the boat unless they come in and see what is here. So. We had a number of years where we really had uh, campaigns that focused on that. Highlands Ranch up close. So all of our all of our printed information, all of our efforts were really you got to come see this. You got to come see this up close. Where there was others, look what's here was a a tagline. It's all right here was a tagline. Welcome home and uh, just that that push to get people to come into the community because we knew once they entered. There was be no more question about this being off in the boonies somewhere, but this was a living, breathing, active community with great parks and open spaces and schools and rec centers. Um, but it was hard to get people sometimes south of those major roadways. Um, I, I just thought, this is just a funny little story, we developed one I thought was the best, the best campaign we had, and it was, it was called Highlands Ranch. Your room is ready. And then we would show outdoor spaces like rec room and we'd show the rec center and we'd show living room and we'd see people, you know, sitting on a picnic blanket in the open space and, you know, dining room and people at a picnic table someplace and all of these things. It was just, we had it wonderfully worked out, beautiful. Honestly, it was like four days before we ran our first story, another builder ran the same campaign exactly the same campaign it was but it was a different community and I was thinking all right who told told those people what we were, but at any rate but just there was a, you talked about challenges earlier that was one of them we had to pivot like that come up with a different campaign and uh, that was part of what it was yeah. how important was the lucent interchange on C470 to your marketing efforts oh it was very very important um, you know, and then really that was more Shea Properties, which was our commercial entity, uh, still is, that uh, was selling uh, uh, property there. Um, uh, it was very, very important. Um, I do recall stories about 
you know, the development of Lucent and the opposition. We had severe opposition, but we had to cross the canal and the beautiful amenity of the, the canal we had to cross and, and you know, trees needed to be removed and whatnot. And uh, I do recall, that, again, this is part of the challenges in the development, and, you know, people from off-site Highland Ranch coming and complaining that you're, you're doing this. And the simple question to those people in a public forum is, well, where do you live? And they tell you where they live, and and you could tie them to well, you get home by a roadway that crosses the High Line Canal as well. Is, why is it okay for you when it's not okay for the future residents of of this great state, right? And uh, you know those kind of rational discussions really quelled the the opposition many times. Didn't that open up the whole west side of Highlands Ranch for uh, better access? Of course, it West opened Ridge. up. It opened up West. Ridge. It opened up everything very well, to be honest with you. But primarily Town, the Town West Center, Side, West absolutely, Ridge, absolutely. All of that. absolutely. And uh, you know, the, with the, the sale of the property to, to Lucent, those office buildings right off of Lucent Parkway, and that's obviously why the road was named Lucent Parkway was accommodating that that sale. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it was a really significant part of of uh, the development. So at some point, somebody had the idea that Elitch's amusement park <laughs> ought to move from its <laughs> location at that time out to Highlands Ranch. Obviously, it's not there right now. It's not. And so I'm sure there's a story. Oh, heavens. Yeah, there was a story. Of, we really thought it would be a tremendous amenity uh, to Isn't this the early 2000s. Yes, it was. Yes, I believe you're correct. And I, being a homeowner here at the time, I kind of remember there was some pushback about that. Yeah, well, I think, again, you have to realize that a, a lot of the uh, a lot of the thinking that came into having a, uh, an amenity like Elitch's in Colorado, in, in Highlands Ranch, came from the thinking about some of the amusement parks in Southern California, and those were Disneyland's, and really a little bit, bit different types of uh, parks and amenities that might exist here. Elitches was a fine amusement park, and I think we felt as a developer that it would bring just a really great amenity to have a new park here in Highlands Ranch, uh, over on the west side, really, uh, sort of at the the, uh, the the southeast corner of Santa Fe and C470, where that is today, uh, the residents were not crazy about it. They uh, there was quite a bit of opposition. We had lots of meetings um, uh, uh, to to just try to inform people what this might mean and how Elitch was what they were planning on. It was playhouses and it was you know, theater and all kinds of things that just would be terrific for the community. But I think the community and the people who were living here at the time had a different impression of the existing amenities uh, that existed in Colorado. And it just didn't, they just felt like it better to have that someplace else and drive to it. Uh, but we, we gave it the old college try. We did realize when there was, uh, you know, an elevated community sentiment that this shouldn't happen. Uh, we, we went in another direction. I do have to tell you, was they organized a, a little event where they said, okay, we're just going to, we're going to let the world know. So one afternoon, we're going to just drive everybody, every resident, drive your car up and down university and honk, just honk your horn all afternoon long. We're going to have, that's going to be our statement of opposition. And uh, this was before we came to a, the conclusion that it wasn't a good idea to have you which has come. But, I do remember uh, Jerry Onyebeni uh, lived right off of University, up on the hill in, in Falcon Hills, and he knew it was coming. He had he had a big banner made uh, and, and had it installed the day of the event that said, Honk if you love Highlands Ranch. And, then, and after that event, the, the Elitch's uh, uh, opportunity kind of fizzled out of it. Yeah. All good. All good. <clears throat> so I'm sure with all of your home building efforts, 
uh, considering the diversity of land that Mission Viejo or other builders built on, there are probably some challenges that occurred over time. I know when I bought a home that Richmond American built in the, the 90s, it was built on land that was uh, had a potential of expansive soil. And so at that point, the design, this was 96, the design was such as that the homes were built kind of up on a platform and they had a subterranean floor and they had sump pumps and all kind of things and French drains around the perimeter and all the homes were there to minimize the potential effects of heating basement floors or other things at this point. Uh, as a community, did you run into any challenges like that and if so, how did you handle them? Yeah, so develop, developing a community the size and scale of Highlands Ranch, you just can't avoid those types of issues, whether it's structural or other other different types of issues that come up uh, that impact homes or neighborhoods or whatever. And My first home in uh, Westridge was all sand. Right. And then my second home in Eastridge was all... All clay. All clay. Yeah, right. And so really, one of our biggest challenges was kind of designing homes to accommodate the varying... Uh, uh, structural needs for the types of ground that the homes are being built on and you know that's just part of the business right and uh, certainly that the engineering of all of those foundation systems has evolved over the years incredibly and, and you know what is done today is just night and day different than what was done 30 years ago but uh, we had a lot of challenges we had uh, some pretty significant challenges early on um, probably nine, late 80s uh, we had a community called Bradford Hills. It was a, a patio home, a duplex home that uh, uh, we experienced some pretty significant issues, structural issues uh, with the homes after having 90 or so homeowners have been closed on their homes. And uh, uh, it turned out that it was a, a, an engineering issue and, and, uh, and you know, Partially because, and I will tell you mostly because at the time uh, with Mission Bureau Company, we did the right thing as a company, no matter what the issue was. But not only because it was that was our stripes to do the right thing, we were early on in Highlands Ranch, and we knew we had to do the right thing in spades in order to not, you know, impact the, the, the trajectory that Highlands Ranch had been on and was hopefully continue on in terms of uh, new home sales. So we really created a great program. We basically fixed everybody's house, moved everybody out, paid for all of their expenses. You know, it was a gold-plated program. I was very, very proud. I was part of it. I, I really was kind of the lead person in terms of handling all of the owners and that type of thing. And uh, uh, it was an unbelievable experience for me to be able to stand up behind the product at that point, uh, and and to be honest, it was very it was a tough time for these homeowners. But I don't think you'd find any that wouldn't tell you that they were just very very satisfied with how we handled the situation. Tough situation, but very very satisfied. And I think we we won. And and I think you know over the years doing business that way was very much part of what what Highlands Ranch is all about. You know, I've heard similar approaches from Jim Teffer and others about when the development plan was being put together. They had the resources, <clears throat> excuse me, of their corporate parent, Philip Morris, that had the bucks to do things the right way, the right way even if it took longer. Absolutely. Uh, because they were taking the long view of things rather than the short-term view. Well, and and, uh, and again, when you look at a, a community the size of Highlands Ranch, it is a long-term endeavor. So yep. you have to manage on a long-term basis. Twice the size of what they had done at the initial development in California. Right, right. Yeah, pretty big effort. Pretty big effort. So after the Shea uh, 
acquisition, whatever, you were selling homes. Yes. And managing groups of people who were selling homes. How many people were working for you under your purview? Well, at one point, uh, Shay, obviously we started off very, very small. Uh, uh, I think Shay had, when they acquired uh, Mission Vio Company, I think Shea was here because we had already sold them some lots at Highlands Ranch, one in Kentley Hills, 100 lots we had sold to, to Shea. That's how we knew about them and they knew about us prior to Philip Morris offering the full community for sale. Um, and we had a, a little community over in the Grant Ranch area over on the west side of town as well. But I think uh, there's about 10 people, 7 to 10 people within the Shea organization here in Colorado, about 19 people came along from Mission Vio Company uh, staff uh, when the acquisition occurred. So probably mid-20 folks to start, and probably at that time two salespeople. And um, uh, we ramped up, and at some point we had 34 salespeople, uh, you know, selling in 17 different locations. We had uh, two sales managers. Uh, we were approaching, at some point, we were in the, uh, the top out at about 700 houses per, per year. Any communities that were developed that you were especially proud of? Oh, man. You know, it, um, yes, all of them. All of them. Yeah. yeah, to be honest with you, we take great pride in, in one thing Shea Homes here in Colorado has taken great pride in is being not only a home builder, we are Shea Homes, but we are a community development company and we take a great amount of pride in, uh, in the communities that we develop. We take a great amount of pride in going and looking at those communities well after they've been sold out just to see how they live and how they've matured over time. And I will tell you, there's not a neighborhood in Highlands Ranch that I can't drive through and just be proud of what we did. Um, you know, I mean, there's varying degrees, and a lot of times those were market-driven, but uh, in terms of what you had to do in order to sell homes, etc. cetera, but uh, very proud of all the communities. But you know, there's there's a lot of little uh, experiences that we had that certainly come to mind. And in terms of pride, one was spaces at the ranch, which was a neighborhood right at the, the corner of uh, Fairview Parkway and Highlands Ranch Parkway. Um, That's just west of the King Supers. There. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. And yeah, they look a little different than a traditional home in Highlands Ranch. Only because they are a little different. And uh, actually, in that that parcel. Uh, where spaces of the ranch exist was uh, uh, planned and, and oriented towards a uh, attached program, townhomes, condominiums, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, we did our best. I, I was still in the land sales uh, 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 effort at that point with Shea, and we did our best to try to sell that. Um, got dangerously close. We had a builder bailout at the last minute. And eventually just said, hey, let's just try something different. And, and actually it was Tim Roberts, a gentleman who works with Shea and has since day one. I think he was the second hire for, for Shea here in Colorado. Uh, he said, why don't we just flip this upside down and do something different? And, and, and we ended up getting some, doing some rezoning there. We went to a single family detached program a program that took up grade uh, down the slope, uh, and uh, and we designed a great new product. Looked sort of crazy at first, we thought, but we knew we had to be different. We knew we had to do something a little bit unique during that time frame in order for it to work, and it just was an incredible success. We had, when we opened uh, for pre-sales, we had people camping out for three days. We had people building fires, you know, as they're waiting to, to buy houses. And uh, it, was, it was an unbelievably successful program, uh, housing program, and, and the, one of the top selling, if not the top selling, uh, uh, housing program in the metro area for, for quite a while. The other one I'd like to mention is 
backcountry. Very, very proud of backcountry. Uh, it, it exists right um, at the end of Broadway, where Broadway terminates at Wildcat Reserve Parkway. And it was always zoned for a lower density uh, 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 neighborhood. Um, uh, we spent uh, Mission and Shea, because both Mission and Shea were involved in planning this, uh, uh, but both organizations spent a lot of time and energy and money uh, creating a beautiful golf community uh, back there on paper. Uh, we'd actually hired a golf designer, and I think it was, I think it was Jack Nicholas, I think, uh, uh, to do some preliminary layouts for golf, and we were pretty far along the way, had done a lot of market research about how this would be accepted, and through that market research, heard loud and clear from the community was that golf is great, but we think living on Colorado open space is just better. So this, we make... This planning was occurred in the mid-90s, since you said Mission VA. Yeah, it started involved. off in the, probably 95, and then Shea picked it up in 97, continued down the, the golf path for backcountry for a while, and, that, and probably it was... 99 or so where we came to the conclusion that we just again needed to kind of break the mold a little bit from what had been done. Uh, Terry Teague who you've probably heard of before was for the most part the, the planner who worked with Shea that planned all of Highlands Ranch, laid out all of Highlands Ranch. I will never forget when we decided to abandon the golf community and go with this this really awesome open space community, high-end open space trails and connection to the open space conservation area. He sat us down and he said, this is the right thing to do. He and said, gated, and a gated community. What's that? And a gated, and a gated community. community. There are, Absolutely. There, there aren't too many of those in Highlands Ranch. No, there aren't, actually. A few Falcon many, Hills is, aren't they? Falcon Hills, Glen Eagles Village, uh, yeah. backcountry. Uh, the high woods, yeah. So all high, you know, for the most part, most higher end. But uh, I remember Terry sitting us down and saying, this is the right thing to do, but this is going to be much harder because there isn't, there's templates for golf communities. You just go see what everybody else has done and you do that, what the successful people have done. This has not been done before. This is going to be harder. And it was. But it, again, unbelievably successful. Yeah, it is. My recollection is that this is probably one of the the biggest tract of undeveloped land in Highlands Ranch in the 2000s. Yep, that would be and right. I understand it's pretty well built out right now. 20 years later, 15 years later. Yeah. In terms of Highlands Ranch being built out? No, in terms of, well, Highlands Ranch is built out too, but in terms of the backcountry. Oh, itself, yes, it is. We exited uh, backcountry probably two, three years ago, yeah. and uh, there re there was remaining, still remains a, a very few custom lots that have not yet been built, but everything else was completely yeah. built out at the time. The other major area, I guess, smaller than the backcountry, that was developed for developed land was Central Park. Yes. And involvement with that? Oh, yes. Um, uh, I was, uh, again, we've gone through cycles, market cycles, and with those cycles we've made changes. So in 2007, during the Great Recession, I moved out of the new home sales program uh, because we needed to have a bigger emphasis back into the land sales side of things because homes were not selling for a number of years and so we needed to do our best to generate uh, some some income through the land, land holdings that we had. So uh, I, I wasn't uh, up close and personal with with uh, Crescendo, but was involved with it. Uh, uh, again, one of those programs that we said, never done this before, but it is our most urban setting probably within Highlands Ranch. Uh, uh, and uh, worked very, very hard to come up with a Homes that just lived marvelously. Obviously, a lot of vertical, a lot of a lot of stairs in those homes. But we found that people didn't care because they lived so marvelously, and and the 
price point was was right. You know, in terms I'm sure of the hospital being close there was a driver too. Close, walkable to town center. Yep. Lots of really, really great things. Um, Crescendo was really one of those that uh, it was just, it was our last new home community that we we built in Highlands Ranch. And uh, we were all very, very proud of it, how it, it performed. It was very It's totally nice. built out now too, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. yeah. So what are your challenges now, given that most of the land in Highlands Ranch has been built out or the land sales or, or the new home sales um, are smaller. What are you doing these days? Well, um, certainly we are an ongoing enterprise here in Colorado and we have new communities that we are working on. Having sold out of Highlands Ranch, we, we you know, saw the writing on the wall. Uh, even, even during, uh, though it took 40 years, we knew that at some point Highlands Ranch would be done. So we have gone into different locations within the Denver metro area. Uh, we were up in the, the northeast part of town for a while. We're no longer in that part of town. We think we, we do a uh, much better job in the, in the southern part of the city. We understand the market a little bit better. We understand the, the municipal groups a little bit better, the, the agencies a little bit better. Um, uh, so we're primarily south. But we've got some really fine master plan communities, uh, the canyons, uh, at solstice over by uh, uh, the Chatfield Recreation. Uh, the canyons uh, area. is uh, down near Castle Pines. Yes, off of Castle Pines Parkway, just mm -hmm. east of I-25, and then at solstice is out at uh, Chatfield uh, State Park, just south of the park, and uh, and we've got a new community coming on called Lyric, which is just. Uh, east of I-25 on Ridgegate Parkway, uh, just is actually uh, a part of the Ridgegate community as it expands to the east. I take it you found water resources for all these new communities. Yes, we have. Uh, and again, you don't build homes build without, without water. water. Right. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, we are we are in less familiar territory because they are not districts that we had a part of running and, and and creating as we did in Highlands Ranch with Centennial. But yeah, we we are very well served uh, by those various districts that supply water to our well, Good. Well, we wish you luck in continuing to develop that. We know that lots of people are experiencing that in migration to Colorado yeah. and hopefully some of that comes your way. Well, I know it will. Uh, we, we, as much as we miss Highland Ranch, and we miss it dearly, um, it has been an unbelievable experience for me. It's been an unbelievable experience for, I know, both organizations that were party to development of Highland Ranch. I don't think you'll see anything like Highland Ranch ever again. Um, so our new communities are smaller. Uh, communities that Sterling don't. Ranch, for example. Well, Sterling Ranch is a big community being developed in phases, right? Not not the quite the size of Highlands Ranch, um, but it will be developed in phases. And I'm not sure exactly where they. I'm not that familiar with that community where they'll end up in terms of build out, but uh, but uh, it's just becoming harder and harder to do just because of the the uh, the capital investment and and just the effort of doing a community like Highlands Ranch. I, I don't know about you, Mark, but I live in Highlands Ranch. I've, I've lived in Highlands Ranch twice now. and Moved away once, came back. Uh, I, I drive into the entry of Highlands Ranch at University or Broadway, and 44 years later, I still can't believe the vision that it takes to create a place like Highland Ranch. It, it's, it's, it's really an unbelievable undertaking, and to see it built out today is one of the most gratifying things for me in my life. When I moved here in 96, it was probably, for what I could afford at the time, probably the best home value. The first home was over in 
Westridge, built by Richmond America. Eventually, my second home was <clears throat> a few years later over in Eastridge at this point, and I've been in that house 23 years, and consider this just a great thing. Uh, Douglas County Taxes says that if you live in the same place for a long time, they give you a break on the property taxes. And so, in comparison to other areas of the country, and I hear from siblings, whatever, my wife and myself, of what they're paying per year for, for property taxes, uh, it's a great value. It is. That and, continues. And it continues to be a great community. Yep. I, uh, uh, again, live here today, and, uh, and still probably every, if not every day, every week, just very, very grateful for the place that I live. I'm maybe a little partial, but uh, you know, when you look at the conveniences, you look at the traffic within the community as compared to outside of the community, when you look at the, the open spaces, it just blow me away. And I, I was part of developing it and planning it, and in using them today, they just they blow me away, to be honest with you personally. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I've been... I've been doing some commuting and rush hour traffic on places outside of our community, and it's pretty brutal. It can be tough. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll give you the last word. What things would you like to tell us in summary? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, again, I uh, it's just been an awesome career for me. I'll probably end my career here before too long. Uh, it has just been a really unbelievable trek uh, over the past 40 years. All the, the experiences that we had, you know, from a development standpoint, from a personal standpoint, from a community standpoint, it's just been a, a tremendous thing. And uh, for me, in today's day and age where everything is so social media and intangible to have Highlands Ranch as my tangible uh, example of my work over the past 40 years is just uh, really, really a great thing for me. I'd love to be able to show it off to my sons along the way and, uh, and I'm proud. I'm proud for what we've done. Good. Well, we want to thank you on behalf of the Highlands Ranch Historical Society for your contributions over your career, four years plus, to the community, and for sharing your insights today in this oral history. So, Jeff, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Appreciate it.